like as much reloose, loose, not reloosed, relaxed, loose <laughs> conversation as possible. We have to sell this idea that we are actual friends. Oh yeah, yeah it's really hard. <laughs> so do your best. You try. <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be the intro. We have to sell that no, idea that we know no. each other. I trust, I trust your judgment. This is your black friend, Wen, and I am here with a, a good friend of mine. I'm going to let him introduce himself because I always hate doing this. I always forget some key important stat or fact. I'll be like, I know you for three years, and then they're like, no, I've known you for seven. I'm like, oh, God. So <laughs> I'm going to allow my incredible good friend to introduce himself, let you know what he's about, and why he is here today. Thanks, Wendell. Thank you for having me. <laughs> my pleasure. Um, no, my name's Elton. Um, Wendell and I met in the, uh, I guess, the Japanese gay expat community. Um, yeah, and we've known each other since 2015. I can tell you the first time that we actually met up in person and what the cuisine was, fish eyes. Oh my god, it was fish eyes, yeah. <laughs> and, I and can the, still feel the retina in my mouth. It was so gross, it was so gross. What's worse is that we caught it, that we ate. It was. It felt a little cruel, but also like circle of life, so it's important. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's important, you know what I mean? Like, I love the circle answer. of life. <laughs> so what, do, what do you do with your life when, when, when we're not talking about black shit? I, I used to be an attorney. Uh, at least I, that's what I was doing when I was living in Japan. Um, and now I just work in legal marketing. Now, I don't want to say just work in legal marketing. I work in legal marketing. The, the exciting part about it is that it actually gives me time now that I never would have had as a lawyer to actually read something. And yeah. so I've been uh, playing a lot of catch up since leaving the law. It's been three years now. I was actually talking about this today. Like, it's helped me. It's given me time to find myself. Um, and like, if I could go back and, and be more well-rounded as a lawyer, I probably would have survived it a little better, but you know, it takes time, but I'm, I'm glad to be where I am. Glad to have the time that I do to make friends and connections and do some different kind of work, you know? How common is your name, Elsa? It's not common at all. Uh, well, at least not, it's not common where I come from. It's not common in my cultures. It's. Uh, my parents chose out of a hat and the reason it was that they literally chose a bunch of random ridiculous names like Michelangelo and, and Terrell um, <laughs> for example <laughs> among many others you know, like um, like really random medieval names and then El Cid was the El Cid El Campeador which is this ridiculous character from Spanish history and um, they pulled that name out of the hat and it was literally because my mom loves the movie with Charlton Heston and Sophia Loren and she made me watch it as a kid, so I know that there's this ridiculously tacky movie about it. And also, weirdly enough, when I was a kid, my neighborhood in Miami had a restaurant called El Cid Restaurant. Yeah. It was, it was a castle. And so every time we'd pass it, it would be like, ah, oh, okay. So it, it's not common, but it pops up in the weirdest places. <laughs> well, did you, were you always, uh, I, I guess I didn't even ask if you're a fan of it now, but is, is it always been a name that you, liked i hated it as a kid because it made me weird and strange i mean name was never like when i introduced myself mm -hmm. it was never blah 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 and move on it was always ah el cid el cid and then i'd have to spell it e-l-c-i-d i know how to spell my name like out of the boom you know <laughs> so i couldn't introduce myself without spelling it to people i'd be like oh that's an interesting name where's that from I'm like i just I don't want to have that conversation every time. Like, it's that conversation. The hat, the name, the medieval, the no connection. Sophia Loren. Like. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm glad I waited for this to be on camera to ask you. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. Just yeah, get it out yeah. the way now. Everyone watch this video if you ever want to know. <laughs> But but there is it's it's not a it's not a weird question like I, I swear to you like I, I I really think about you know these kind of connections and that name with that face I feel like is is kind of a an interesting juxtaposition if I hear like El Cid I get like deserts and and Moroccan and <laughs> the kind of fake 
Agrabah kind of fake Aladdin, like, and there was yeah. El Cid at the top of the hill. <laughs> like, <laughs> what a fez. Like, that's why, like, and I know yeah. all of that shit is not right, but th that's what I hear when I hear El Cid. That's fair. That's and then fair. I see you, and I'm like, how'd that happen? <laughs> How do we how do we address that? How do we deal with that? How do we challenge those kinds of thinking, including mine just now? That's that's interesting. That's and no one's ever asked me that. I, I don't know. I was always called myself ethnically ambiguous, and I you know if people ask and they want to know, then we have the conversation. But there's layers to it, as you know. Like you get deep enough, it's surprise he's Jewish, not Catholic, and so like there's a lot of layers built into that and every country i go to i'm racialized as a different thing you know i go anywhere in latin america and they'll presume that i'm local or when i live in japan they presume that i had some japanese in me surely you have some japanese in you like no no none zero zero asian nothing at all or you know i go to france and people speak to me in french or you know in, in miami then everyone talks in spanish and you get told that you know you are part of this minority of, you know, Cubans that have experienced this racism and this discrimination. And then you're like, oh, okay, so fine. You take that on board. And then you move to New York and you meet African-Americans who are like, you know, you're white. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> you know, in the opposite way, I've, I've, had, I've had to speak up in rooms where people think everyone in there is white and they're making fun of Cuban refugees. And I'm like, Sorry, like I hate to interrupt your fun, but you know, <laughs> there's, there's a brown person in the room. Whenever someone in Japan would make the, the, the compliment, like you're attractive for a black guy. Mm. This is not the worst thing I've ever heard. I do not like this. I'm going to say something about it. It's like this, oh God, we have to do this today. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, like, and I thought you were cute. Like, oh, we got to do this. <laughs> I, I, I liken it to, like, pulling out your GPS maps and being like, fuck, you are on the other side of the mountain. Okay. You know? <laughs> That's what it feels like. I got to walk with you all this way now. <laughs> Although I, the, the family does come from Moroccan Jews. So that's like... What's that? My family does trace back to Moroccan Jews. So it's like a thing. Hey! <laughs> Not totally off. No, not at all. <laughs> I always try to think of good ways to explain different concepts. Like, I feel that the way that we constantly talk to each other or talk at each other in some cases, you're not, you're not getting on their level. And that doesn't mean that I think you should go down to where people are. I think you should bring them up. I think you should always mm. be trying to educate and, and bring them up. So one thing I said about this show um, I, I will not invite someone on who does not have an, a thing to teach me. No. I will not bring someone on who has not done some kind of research, some kind of self-education about any topic. It doesn't necessarily have to be about black sh shit. I'm trying not to say black shit over and over, but it's my phrase now. <laughs> um, it can be about anything, but it, if there is no discourse, if there's no conversation, if there's no me asking you, you asking me, if it's just me telling you, well, I was the black community, where you think that you should stop being racist? Like, I don't want that, but there's enough of that in the world. And I don't want someone going, hey, black person, you know, you're my black friend, tell me what to do. I agree. I think it's really, it's a beautiful sentiment. And I wholeheartedly agree. So, one thing that, um, that we kind of talked about earlier, um, about passing, and for me, that's, that's such a fascinating thing because wherever I go, this is my skin color. You know, like Aquafina in Japan could try to lighten me or whatever, <laughs> whatever they did to Beyonce, Crystal Geyser, you know, they can, they can do what they want to lighten me, but wherever I walk in public, this is how I look. Yeah. And I always just find it incredibly fascinating for a person who can, who doesn't have to come out about their racial identity. You know, I guess in the same way, homosexuals can choose to come out in certain situations. Yep. So I really want to kind of get your perspective on, on the passing and how you being ethnically ambiguous, um, how you navigate throughout the different countries you've been, especially in America, especially in New York. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, 
I've, I've thought about this a lot recently. I mean, since, since moving back to America, mm-hmm. um, I spent almost 10 years overseas, half in Australia, or more than half in Australia, and then the last bit in Japan. And in each country, I would experience a different kind of, um, I guess, a growing awareness that I was being seen in different ways by different people at different times. So I had learned to feel that instant sense of either comfort or fear, depending on how I could read that person and how they were in turn reading me. It was strange and honestly difficult to come to terms with the idea that, you know, in some places I'll be seen as white and in other places I'll be seen as part of the community and in other places, you know, you know, for instance, I've been questioned going into synagogues, like, oh, prove to me you're Jewish because I don't look like a white Jew. But, you know, I don't have similar problems, you know, going into, you know, other spaces, you know. So it's, it's always interesting to walk into a room and be like, how are people seeing me now? You know, like, and yeah. it depends on who I'm walking with, for example. Like, this happened in our neighborhood when you were staying with us at the bodega. They would speak Spanish to me and English to you. And then when I'd go in there by myself, they'd speak English to me. And I was just like, okay, so I read as white when I'm by myself, but I'm Latino when I'm with Wendell? That makes no <laughs> sense. <laughs> yeah, but it's arbitrary. It's just what people see. So. I, I find that so fascinating. And I, I remember when that situation happened, and you pointed it out as, like, that was weird. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> like, I, mm. I see it as because I don't speak spanish that i'm just thinking oh they can look at my look on my face and be like oh no <laughs> we're not even gonna try there are plenty of black people who speak spanish and that, of course that of course of course a, no but that's a latino thing yeah like, like oh, me, i just felt us. like i felt like i looked out of place and i looked like that wasn't my hood that's how i felt so mm-hmm. i didn't i didn't take any kind of i didn't think about him not speaking to me in spanish and so when he did it to you it's like Ah, do they look at you and just know? I really wanted you to introduce yourself. I wanted to leave that up to you if you wanted to introduce, you know, what your makeup was or not. That's interesting. Because I, 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 I think it's better to organically kind of have this conversation. Just like, like I think coming out. I think if you're talking to someone and you say my boyfriend, it, it, it makes them kind of go, oh, okay, well, I, I have to deal with this very quickly because the conversation keeps going as opposed mm. to sitting down and going, my name is Wendell and I am black. Like, it's, it's a fascinating topic, but it's not, it's not everything. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't want my blackness to be everything I am. And I'm proud of my blackness, and I, I'm doing all of this because I'm proud of my blackness. That's, that's, that's where I guess the conversation of passing does, does reach its, its pointy end. Because passing means being able to step out of that. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, it's like going into the closet in a sense, and sure, you aren't living a fully enfranchised life, but that doesn't come down on your body in violent ways and in systemic ways. So, I mean, we, we, in talking about all our facets, you know, we were talking about this earlier, that there's a Jewish side to me and that, you know, I am Latino, I have, you know, various backgrounds and histories in other countries, but the moment things get any Semitic, I'm, all I am is Jewish, and that's it. And I think the fact that I can switch into that is both good and bad. And it required me to have a very big lesson on the privilege it is to be able to do that. Because like my black Jewish friends are not able to do that. Completely, it's a a completely unfair privilege and advantage. It's about holding that space and making sure that you use that privilege to open up the door for the people that are, you know, in a proverbial sense, standing behind you in the equality ladder, opening yeah. that door and making space for them in those spaces. Because wherever I, wherever I find myself, there's always a more marginalized person. And, you know, that being forced to be aware of that was because of being passing and noticing the differences in the way people interact. I find it really fascinating, you know, that that's, that, that's where your head is. There's always someone more marginalized because mm. you know being being raised the complete opposite you know being raised that I am the always marginalized person um, it, it's 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 almost like an how ideal you know 
And don't get me wrong, as I've gotten older and I've, I've started to learn about my own kinds of privilege, you know, like being a man, um, help being a six foot one black man, like in many ways that's scary for some people, but in other ways, I've say, learned, that's a double edged sword. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've learned from my father that that's, that's a good and bad thing. You can use that intimidation in some ways and in other ways you have to tone it down or be killed, you know, for bird watching. I'm hanging with the Coopers. The, the, the meat of the problem that they both have the same last name. And that to me is just so American. That is the most American thing. Yep. A tale of two Coopers. That's why I love your, your uh, GPS uh, analogy because it really is like that. It really is. Oh, you just mm. discovered this for the first time. Let me, let me come over there. I'm going to hold your hand and we're going we're gonna to get through this. You're going to learn about your privilege. No, nope. come back. I know, I know it's scary. I know that you don't want to hear that you are, you know, a, a product of white supremacy. I know. I know you don't want to hear that. I know you don't like that word. I know you think of hoods and not the fact that my history is not in your textbook. That's what real white supremacy is. That's why you don't learn about all of the, the atrocities that white supremacy, supremacy is beaten down upon black bodies in this country. You don't learn about the Tulsa race massacre until what Watchmen comes out and makes it a talking point. Really, we needed all of this fellow, right? In twenty twenty, before this year, the way that I thought about a lot of history here, I thought of it as a subset of American history, in a way that well, these are what these marginalized groups are doing. You know, um, almost almost in a in a, in a I don't even know how to put it. It's like almost in a nice, pristine crystal form. Like I can look at it and be like, that happened to black people at this time. And this happened, yeah. Harlem Renaissance. Like there are these moments, but they're not interwoven into actual mm. history. They're like little beads, but they're not part of the actual tapestry. Gayest reference ever, I know. It, it I wasn't the you. yarn, it was the adornment. And mm. one thing that I really want to do as much as I can is to make my history, black history, your history, everyone's history, like, because it is. And, and I want people to realize that the Tulsa Race Massacre and Greenwood, Oklahoma, real places, real events that happened in America, and it does shape the America we're living in today. It wasn't a one-off thing. And that's a, that's a view I didn't get until this year. Like, that's something that I finally went, oh, shit, when I'm looking at, uh, when I'm looking at people bombing in, in Syria, and people complaining about not having basic human rights. That's happening here too. You know, we, we don't have as many bombs, but bomb. we do have militant police officers. We do have a system that is very obviously holding us back without making any pretense about it. How much of that do you think is influenced by the fact that we spent so much time overseas? Like if you know what can be better, particularly Japan, if you know what can be better, if you know another existence, it's kind of like space travel and you can compare it and people that live here who are so adamant America is the best. You know, like, have you seen what can be? Have you walked into a hospital bleeding and no one asked the question, they just took you in? You know, I'm, I remember the first time I really felt like I loved America and that was abroad. It wasn't mm -hmm. living here. I, I remember, you know, Obama was president and I, I saw so many young people being involved with politics and giving a damn and not not just Obama but local elections like things I learned how our actual democracy worked because I didn't learn it in school but following him I figured out the electoral college so that was like the that was really like I'm in Japan I'm just like I love my country like this is great like I'm, I'm glad I came from there because I can see the good things that I couldn't see living there mm. you know but then also you start to see the cracks too. And we're seeing a lot of cracks with COVID, especially in, in healthcare and, and racial inequality. And yeah. the, you know, look who's getting kicked out of their homes and who isn't beaten up by the police and who's walking around with guns with no problems. I always like saying this apocalypse means lifting the veil. And right now a lot of people are seeing that veil being lifted and seeing that this is just not it. The reason why I ultimately decided to call this Your Black Friend Win is just because I have been that friend for a lot of people. I have been that one where why do black people blah, blah, blah. And you know, that I can calmly, okay. 
first of all, mm. it's always the same. We are not a monolith. <laughs> first of all, I don't speak for all of us. That's Oprah's job. <laughs> it's, it's just true. <laughs> if, if you had to ask any black person in the world, what do you think? Like, mm -mm. come here, Oprah. <laughs> Got this. <laughs> I will take Obama as as a backup and Michelle on the same level. I do not <laughs> Brock and Michelle as a couple and and Oprah. That's it. That's it. I will. Everyone else has their own opinion <laughs> and shall be consulted individually <laughs> uh, beforehand. See, and and you know it was so unfair because Obama knew that like he knew he had to be perfect. He knew that anything he did wore a tan suit would be criticized. Yeah. But, you know, this, this, the current, I, I can't even say leader. <laughs> that almost made me laugh. <laughs> this, 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 the, the, the current title holder. <laughs> the current occupant <laughs> of the White House. <laughs> it's like the, the, the reigning pageant queen who, <laughs> who unfortunately has not, you know, fulfilled her duties and still doesn't have to give up her crown. <laughs> Um, it, we, we judge him individually. And I, I've always felt that to be such an unfair double standard for minorities. You, uh, you suddenly represent all of your people. And it's this tendency of white people to see themselves as individuals, but mm. minorities as communities, throngs of people. Now, would, you, would you say you have those kind of moments where you feel like you are representing? Yeah. I feel like uh, if I wear a kippah, like uh, a skull cap, I feel like I'm definitely representing the community and I'm also putting my out, myself out there in a way that could, it makes me feel vulnerable. Um, and when I am, this happened a lot in Australia, where I was the darkest person in the room. Imagine that. And the questions come along like, oh, the word swarthy has been used in reference to me before. That's All right, it. swarthy, because if you're not a pirate, I didn't think you could be called swarthy. <laughs> My doubloons in my pocket already. Oh my, you're about to make me RuPaul laugh. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a what a thing to call a person. Yeah, I had just come back from a holiday and I came back really dark and I had my beard. It's just my boss was like, Oh, you just you look so so dark, so swarthy today. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> Weirdly enough still friends with this person. Okay. But just, you and sound like a dark boat thief is really... <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> that's so and that's Australia for you, right? Like, I don't know why does that play? <laughs> you brown buccaneer, you. I know. <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> I can't. I'm ready. Oh. I, I really, really appreciate this time. This, this, besides the fact you. that, that, you know, this is content that we can share, it's just always fun talking to you. Same. I enjoy, I really enjoy your perspective. And I am so appreciative to be in your life. Thank you. And likewise, I can legit just repeat that, like one of those mocking J's <laughs> yeah. from the movie. <laughs> Was it Mocking Jay? Before I let you go, um, because now I'm really thinking a lot about Latinx. And this will probably help me a lot as I'm now living in New York and living with a lot of, of a lot more diversity. Uh, how, how would I best address people without asking them? And that's something I'm, I'm a big fan of. I would much rather just ask you one-on-one, -on -one, what would you like if, if I'm not sure? But mm -hmm. are, there, are there some common words that we can that that we can huh. um ugh, i don't want to say categorize but no but yeah i that's the thing there's like latinidad like, which is like latinness is like whiteness in in, in, in as a concept and at least mm. that's how i see it how it's applied actually and some people accept it and some people don't some people because of colorism some people will say I am Latino to approximate themselves towards whiteness. Others will reject that. Um, it's that everyone uses it for different reasons and it's because it's so political. Like some people prefer the word Hispanic. To me, Hispanic literally means people from Spain. So it cuts out Brazilian. So then I don't feel an affinity. So 
you know, I usually just ask people where they're from or what I don't say where they're from because that's never good. I usually ask people where they grew up. So where did you grow up? And then you, you can have a conversation from there. But I, I love that when people ask me, I think it, I, I'm feel like, oh, you, you see that. Okay, cool. I'm glad you see me. You know, that's nice. It's very affirming. Mm. Thank you for that. I, I really think a lot about my family. This is probably just, you know, one of our blind spots uh, as being African-Americans and growing up with our own issues and fights that sometimes we don't ask other people, you know, like how can we best serve your community as well? I don't think it's incumbent upon black people to do that though. I think, I, at least from my perspective, I come at this from a, a lot of privilege. There's so much privilege baked into being Latino that like if, if I was in, for example, if I was in a universally lecture and we people were talking about racism and a person that looked like me stood up and said, I have experienced racism, I would pull them aside and say, okay, what you've experienced is something that's one-on-one, -on -one, individual people. You haven't experienced systems that want to exterminate you. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about here. And that's what the conversation is. And you bringing up your particular experience of racism is a distraction. And it's also an equ a false equivalency. It doesn't mean you understand anything at all what this is like. We're talking about the matrix here. You know, your little interactions are what they are, and I'm sorry for, for what they are. We've all had them, but it's a different conversation, I think. Yeah. You know, like, if, I, if I'm talking to, like, an, an, an Asian American or a, another minority, I feel that, you know, we, we also, in, in, the, in my family, alone, Black community, just in general, um, you know, people make little jokes that, because I lived in Asia, now I'm more sensitive to them, and when they're just like, oh, did you live in China? I was like, no, I was in Hong Kong. It's the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. You know, like, I feel like that's something I can do to, mm. to educate people on the, the place that kept me for 10 years, that let me stay for 10 years. So I'm, I'm always trying to be considerate of, uh, yes, we have a lot that we need to do as black people and, and get our rights up and get our, our situations together. But we don't want to do it like stepping on anyone and making jokes or, you know, Black Lives Matter, but the China flu. I see know. what you mean. It's, it's integrity. I don't feel like doing key sign off. I, I always enjoy talking to you. I always feel like I gain so much insight and so many like concepts that even though we agree on a lot of things, there are still, you know, like every time I talk to you, every single time, it's like, oh, I didn't even think of that or I didn't know that was a thing. Same. So, no it's cheese sign off. such an just, enriching relationship. Yeah. for me personally and i'm so grateful likewise for real and th this this whole series is just about the fact that we are lucky that we met and we have the ability to have this conversation whereas a lot of people don't have those connections outside their bubbles so um no i'm 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 heartfelt grateful that we can talk to each other and have this conversation and share it to other people and and I just want to thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Truly. Absolutely.